son. Where'd you find this? Buckle up, buttercups. It's time to get down to business. Oh, yeah. It's the Totally Legitimate Business Podcast. Totally Legit. It's the Totally Legitimate Business Podcast, and we're back, and we're here with Ian Brown. Ian Brown, welcome to the show, bub. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. There we go. Finally yeah. came through. What what, what, we, what did we do last time? You, it was you, Sam. What did we do? It was you, me, and Sam. We were talking about some of the uh, conspiracy theories in automotive oh, yeah. world. Yeah, that's right. F1 and stuff. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we still have to do those follow-ups. We'll just we'll have to see what Sam's doing. But anyways, you're on the show today, and I don't know how to get into the topic, but you were telling me before we started this show about vaping at Disney, and I think it's important information for all people to know, because I learned some things that I did not know about vaping at Disney. Uh, what, do you, what would you say is the most important thing for people to know about when vaping while at Disney? Well... Uh, Probably that technically you're not supposed to. Well, but you were saying but, there's like this one special designated area where it's acceptable yeah, to vape. Uh, I have yet to find it. Um, supposedly it's in California Adventure. So I've been told uh, years ago there used to just be spots for us cool kids to smoke in both parks. Really? Cigarettes, really? cigarettes yeah wow. <clears throat> and now it's no more so i uh i have to bring in my vape and then this time around i i went and bought zins and i told myself uh the um, the amazing thing about advertisement and social media is how zins are now portrayed for the super douchey frat boy uh, <laughs> personality type and as I'm in the smoke shop I'm like uh, I should probably think a little bit ahead and if the vape I get in trouble for it at the most magical place on earth then I should have these little pouches and I told myself and the vape guy that uh, I had, this is the first and only time I would buy him because I didn't want to fit the portrayal of a douchey frat boy that that guy was probably like mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was like eh, i put these things in all the time man yeah exactly um but they actually worked really well so but um yeah i vape in disney so what i'm trying to look up the name of that restaurant but i can't f seem to find it i don't think you will it's like uh it's a hidden secret of California Adventure, I guess, because I've been told in California Adventure that it's there. I cannot find it. Okay. Um, it wouldn't be in Disney because California is the only place that you can get liqueurs. Yeah, because uh, the, the search that I'm doing says, regarding your question, there are no designated smoking areas on the Disneyland Resort property. That vapes aren't illegal. You can bring vapes, but they just remind you no vaping. Yeah. Are you Disney or California Adventure? I I, I searched for California <clears throat> Adventure, but I'm not finding. Okay. Uh, yeah. The official Disneyland Resort rules prohibit smoking in Disneyland Park, Disney Disney California Adventure Park, Downtown Disney Park, and the Esplanade between the parks. Presently, there are no designated smoking areas on the property for smoking. Well, all I know is is vape on Christian warriors. If you're in uh, if you're in Disney and you need your Nick fix, go ahead and grab it. Yeah, you I know, mean they're probably going to catch you on video. You might get arrested. You may be detained in the jails underneath the park, but. Right. It'll be worth it. Right. And that part would be worth it. I think, you know, first what they're going to do is they're going to send a very happy, underpaid, understaffed employee to come up to you and be like, hey, we got you on video, like, in a thousand different video cameras. We know you're <laughs> vaping. 
we know your nose isn't runny and you're you're not a dragon you're putting your head into your shirt <laughs> and just you know miraculously plumes are coming out uh so we're just gonna have to ask you to stop and then you do it again and then they're gonna send you know some bigger underpaid understaffed employee but it still is nice and friendly because it's the most magical place on earth and For they'll now. tell you to stop and then probably the third time you'll go into the labyrinth that is the underground bunker of Disneyland. Yeah. That's so. the cool part. That's the part I want to see. I yeah. don't give a shit about the rides. I want to see the bunker. Right. I often think when I'm there, how I, I pose the question to myself, if a zombie apocalypse or like a doomsday weapon were to go off when I'm here, what's the ratio of how screwed I would be because of the plebeians that are just littered around the park and how safe I'd be with knowing that underneath is just, I mean, you know more than me probably for sure, but just the craziness that is the underground. Uh, I mean, if, if, a if, a if a bomb, like a nuke went off, yeah, being underground would be more ideal, I guess. Right. I don't know if they're like actually rated as bomb shelters, but it wouldn't surprise me. No, but I, I mean, okay, a bomb, you'd probably be even more screwed. But if something happened, it's just like, you know, I've heard stories underneath this thing. You could probably, you know, live here. What's that movie? Uh, uh, Zombieland, where they go to the theme park. Sure. And just be like, you know, I could probably stay here for a good couple years. Just eating cotton candy and carameled apples and... Hanging out in my bunker. And living in tunnels with Mickey and Minnie. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, you know, I... I, I, uh, I don't know, it's a strange place. Um, Disney adults uh, confuse me. Um, and it's just funny to me that that place is so restrictive and it's probably one of the most surveilled places compounds on earth. Oh yeah. I don't know. It's very, it's very funny. Yeah. It's wild. And like the tunnels, like the tunnels make sense. The tunnels, what's the easiest way to get around a, a complex like that? Having right. On, on, you know what I mean? Like it just makes sense having like subway style terminals where you could quickly get across the park. Doesn't matter what the crowd is. There's not going to be a crowd down there. Um, but, uh, I just love that the prison is down there. The jail is down there. Yeah. yeah so don't let him catch you. One. Don't let him catch you vaping because you'll go there, but you sh should feed your addiction. Yeah. I mean, it said in the fine print they allow it, so that's kind of saying you get you get one get out of jail free card. Really? I mean, no, but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it could work. You just pick your one time wisely. Yeah, I guess to get your fix. I guess, yeah. Space it out. Chug, chug your vape in the parking lot before you go in there, and then really time that. Right. Hail Mary. And then go to California Adventure, and then you can just drink all day and all night long. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool to be an adult at a Disney park. Yeah. Sure. It's cool. It's cool. Sure. They, so they say, <laughs> don't listen to what they say. It's cool to be an adult at Disneyland. Right. But Disney adult's amazing. So anyways, Ian, uh, you, you, you proposed a topic idea. So I, I maybe, maybe I should just let you expand on what it is you want to talk about today, but we were kind of getting into it on the phone the other day. Uh, and it was good. We paused, but what, yeah. what, what makes you want to talk about this subject? Um, well, when we were on the phone the other day, we were talking about how when I was teaching my students, and I guess I should start by for Yeah, what now. do you do? What do you do? What do you mean so, students? Yeah. Uh, so actually, 
February, we don't know the exact day of when I started, but it was sometime in February, we believe, so this would be now, six years I've been with an organization called Children of Production LA. And what we do is we provide music lessons and training and, you know, just how to become a good musician, a wholesome mentorship. person, mentorship, absolutely, to uh, outrisk kids in the greater Los Angeles area. And so I've had kids from and still have kids in the Long Beach area, the Carson area, L.A. proper, East L.A. Um, I mean, just all over. I've had kids, um, and our main headquarters is right in the heart of South Central. Um, and then recently, just the past two years, Children of Production LA has uh, come under the umbrella of, a, of another organization called the Inner City Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles. And they've been around for... Um, I believe roughly the same amount of time, if not even a little bit longer, but um, huge organization for more orchestral music. <clears throat> so your strings, when it comes to drums, we're talking timpani. Timpani stuff, yeah, orchestral absolutely. stuff. Absolutely, very orchestral. And they wanted us on because... Uh, Mr. Dickerson, the founder of that organization, he he said it very perfectly in my in my ears is like um you know if you're a child or i mean doesn't matter your age if you're privileged enough to get your hands on a violin or a cello or a stand-up bass financially you're doing pretty good those things are not cheap yeah. by any means. I even mean, to just, rent. <clears throat> even to rent. I mean, a violin just in itself could be, you know, the price of two, three snare drums. Um, and so he knew that the organization that he had was working with a lot of students and people that, you know, I mean, have a lot of support via their parents or uh, financially. And so he wanted to introduce a drum line to be able to kind of just bring youth and a different perspective of music um, and also allow students who, you know, don't have the means to be able to actually go out and buy an instrument to be able to come and learn either drums or just, I mean, you could do just straight um reading and understanding of music composition and just uh, go with that approach. So in a nutshell, that's what I do and I love it to death. And so going back to the question of right. what we talked about is <clears throat> the age group of my kids now, I mean, I've got kids from six years old to 22, 23 years old who have now aged out of the program. But um, now I'm dealing with a lot of younger kids, a lot of beginner learning. You know, we're past learning how to hold the sticks. Now we are working on thinking and being musical. And I'm I caught myself in a situation teaching where I was trying to tell them, like, you know, my snare drums are are chugging along and my bass drums get to this certain part of a cadence and they just overpower tempo-wise everyone else and then just the whole thing falls apart. And... You know, I've already instilled in them, you know, this is different than, you know, you going to school and doing an assignment. Like, yes, you have a task that you have to do. We're going to learn these cadences. You're going to learn these notes. Uh, you're going to learn what they mean. Understand what the notation looks like on paper. But this is music. This is not a homework assignment. And then 
and with that, it's trying to teach them how do you how do you teach someone who just doesn't know and can't hasn't developed the muscle yet to feel musicality to feel music to say to the bass drums you know you need to be an ally to your snare drums you need to listen to them you need to stop thinking about your assignment and trying to connect with the other members of your band and um you know it's super fascinating to see how and when that trait actually clicks on and clicks off when you're teaching younger students so i left that practice just kind of like man you know i've got i've got like 30 years in music and i through my first band with you and every other band since and every other road traveled and experience and this that and the other like i feel like i've got a good understanding of what musicality being musical is and it's like who do i have to talk to about that to really just sit down in the trenches and talk like I guess the first word out of my mind is like a spiritual. I see music sometimes very spiritual, spiritual with it, huh? I mean, that's where Trying this conversation is. Maybe you can help me find a more appropriate word for it. But just to be able to sit and talk to someone about like, you know, our upbringing in music and what made us understand what we see music is to us you know umpteen many years into it well i mean i think uh i think and i've always kind of felt this way i think there's a lot of people there's a difference between knowing and understanding and i think that's kind of what we're talking about here like there's plenty of people that can play an instrument but very few people understand how to say something with their instrument like again the the musicality uh, uh, what separates x guitar player over x guitar player what separates x drummer over x drummer that that intangible thing that's like you know i i don't know the the what, the comparison i'm trying to make here is like plenty of people can pick up an instrument anyone in fact i really do believe anyone could pick up an instrument and at least understand the function of how to play the instrument how to make it make noise but then actually doing something with that noise or saying something specific and unique with that noise that really only comes from understanding the instrument not just knowing how to play it. Is it, does that any of that make sense? hundred percent. Like, so yeah. that's, that's, that's kind of how I've always looked at it. And that, that really applies as like a global rule. There's tons of shit. I know stuff about, I don't understand them. You know, I know that rockets shoot people into space. I don't understand every element of how that happens. Sure. But at least <clears throat> with music, I mean, you and I have spent, more time making music than not making music at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like, uh, I don't know if it's something, I don't know. Cause I feel too, there's like, we were, especially when we were playing music when we were kids, like we were still like, you were really good. We were kind of good. We were kind of like catching up to, you would put way more hours of actual practicing in than the rest of us had to our shit. But, I do remember a fair amount of like in that band, which was my first real band that played shows and, you know, rehearsed consistently. That was, that was how I had to learn how to like listen to the rest of my band. It's not like I can play in my basement by myself. I can play to recorded tracks, but when I'm in a room with people, I can't just be, you know, steaming stomping through every single thing as loud as possible like i have to be listening to what they're if they're not doing that and i'm doing that that's going to sound terrible 
Right. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like it's one of those things that really cannot be taught. It can only be learned. And some people might learn it super fast, but it's, it's something that, and you know, dude, I, I, especially once I got into recording, like I still have to check myself frequently. I'll be doing something and be like, this does not fit. Like how mm -hmm. I'm, how I'm playing this right now, how I'm presenting this, how I'm interjecting it into this mix. That does not work. It's cool, but I need to, I need to finesse it a little bit more to yeah. Yeah. fit in there. Right. Yeah. And it took me a while to do that too. I mean, you know, the, I, so starting out in our band, same applied to me. I mean, I was the basement drummer for, I mean, you know, like I started when I was six and then when I was seven or eight, I got my drum set. So it was from, we'll say eight until Catalyst started, which we were 13, 12, 13, 12 yeah. 13. <clears throat> I was just the basement drummer and, you know, I was headphones in and it was stealing my sister's Spice Girls cassette or the Now CDs or drumming to Blink-182 or Bare Naked Ladies or my mom's country. All of that tracks so fucking hard. <laughs> dude, if I'm lying, I'm dying, man. Like, that I, tracks so hard, dude. And, you know... The crazy thing is, is I use those bands, like I use the, this is kind of veering off, but it's important, like using the Now CDs or the Spice Girls cassette or the Bare Naked Ladies, I hold as kind of like a, like a medal of of importance because it's like when I met you guys, then it was, I mean, the floodgates open to rock and roll. Um, but I'm able to now go back and, you know, I can, I can do rock and roll. I can do metal all day long. That's the music that makes me the most happy, but you know, you give me a singer songwriter sort of John Mayer, Jason Mraz esque artist to work with or some poppy this that or the other and it's like well but i have i have roots in these stomping grounds like i i know what made all those songs on the now cds so popular i can drum to those you know top 40 songs i understand the mission statement as a drummer on those things yeah and uh you know, so I was doing that in my basement, you know, for years and years and years. And then our mutual friend got us, got me out of the basement and introduced me to you guys. And then it was just like, okay. You completely go. ruined your life. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, it was like, go at it. Just. Everything was fine until we <laughs> came along. Right. I mean, but then everything got better. Um, you know, and then I got in the catalyst, which was just throw everything at every song and it will all be amazing. And uh, then, or you know, we sure thought so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, We definitely did. Uh, but, you know, at that age, yeah, go for it, man. Definitely go for it. And then, you know, as you get older, when I'm in my 20s and I'm in music school, um, I still wanted to throw everything at it. I still, you know, like as a drummer, I'm super bass drum heavy. Uh, I love putting as much bass drum in as I can and everything. And then, um, as you go through school and you meet different musicians and you understand <laughs> different music. And then on top of that, immediately afterwards, like, you get into a group that's super homage to older rock and roll music, which was not anywhere near the type of, you know, Abe Cunningham of the Deftones or Danny Carey of the Tool or 
mud vein double bass yes drumming. danny carey of the tool yes. <laughs> of the tool yes um <laughs> cuban b <laughs> cuban b um so that kind of like you know although i i loved the gypsy hawk music it humbled my ass down a lot too because there was no double bass in any of that it was quite the opposite of what I was doing in Catalyst, it was somewhat of what I was trying to hold on to in music school. And then, you know, dare I say with age, you're just like, yeah, I don't want to fucking flop around that fast anymore. Like I still can, there's still parts of me where I really want to like grip my teeth. Yeah, no, no, that, that, and I think, I really do think it's different for drummers. Like I, I wasn't a drummer. I did drum. I do love drumming, but I wasn't, you know, that's not what I was focusing on. And, uh, it, it took me a while to understand that about drummers It's different for you guys, because for you guys, it's all about the groove. Whatever hap whatever happens over top of the beat doesn't fucking matter because mm -hmm. the beat you're driving the fucking ship. You know what I mean? It can be a four on the floor. It can be some crazy time signature swapping back and forth. It doesn't matter. Like the, the, the rock, the foundation still has to be there. However, they're painting over top of it. It doesn't matter. Right. Like it, 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 it you know, I, I, I wouldn't understand why all of the metal drummers wanted to listen to the jazz drummers. Or even some of the metal drummers and jazz drummers wanting to listen to like old school country western drummers or like big band drummers. I it didn't make sense. But then as I developed my you know, the lexicon of musicians in my mind and was more aware of drummers and you know I'm sure you sent me on a couple rabbit holes. Bernard Purdy, you know, like there's probably a a, 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 a buddy Rich. Yeah. There's probably a rabbit hole or two you sent me down about him, but uh, it's hard to make sense. It's like the dr drummers doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what genre. It's how how tight to the click am I? How can I do this naturally? How smooth can I make this very unnatural thing? How yeah. how unique and distinct can I? You know, I, I I don't know that that is different for drummers in that respect. Uh, you know, even it, it, even as like gospel chops become more of a thing and like uh, as ubiquitous as they are in music now, they weren't at one point, but just like just seeing the best drummers in pop music look back to fucking the roots, you know, church on Sunday. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I don't know. It, like, <clears throat> drummer dr is different for drummers than it is for, for Every, I'm sure every type of musician, you know, the types of instruments they play, there's like a whole, it's like Instagram accounts committed to memes about it, but. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think about, you know, cause I'm trying to think of the comparisons of drumming and like a melodic guitar playing because, you know, on the topic of like gospel drumming and your approach to that style of drumming and other styles. So like, for example, like, you know, in 2000, early 2000s, right when YouTube was already kind of streaming along for a little bit now, I believe. Uh, but I just remember like YouTube being just flooded with gospel chop drummers. Like yeah. it was right before, um, Oh God, his name's escaping me now. But right before, um, what's his name? Man, I'm going to kick myself later. Uh, for Mars Volta. Thomas Pridgen. Thomas Pridgen. Thank you. Like right before he got into that group and then during gospel chops was just like everything. thing. Yeah. It was the thing. And not that it's a horribly complex thing to try to get your head around, the, here's a crazy thing about that is it's like it's inserting yourself into church and only having a piano player that has to do triple duty of being the bass player, 
the piano player conductor conductor band director and yeah. then you know having to somehow sprout a third or fourth arm and do some other thing on the piano because you only have two musicians in this small little church and then you have the drummer and the drummer you know just spending day in day out there being around his drum first of all all the time but then also having to do double duty to help that piano player out you know that's a form of you know like how you can really understand okay yeah i get gospel chops but in a similar way i would argue it's like it's the same stuff that a um a, a slipknot drummer would be doing or a heavy metal drummer a double sure. bass fast 30 second notes down the toms um different orchestrations obviously different musical textures Choices. yeah yeah but very similar um and yeah I, I don't know to me like it it took me a long time to understand the benefit of really appreciating other stuff and I mean, I always listen to other stuff, but I don't think I really started to appreciate the diversity of music, all the flavors that I could have. It wasn't just 32. I could have as many as I wanted. Mm -hmm. And and I, we were always that way, even in middle school, though. Like, we, we listened to also... Yes, we listened to new metal, a lot of new metal, but we also listened to other shit. All of us did. And uh, I think that that is also like a crucial component in developing the musicality. Like how, what, what, how do you know how to differentiate between music? Listen to a fuck ton of music, know the differences and subtleties between a bunch of different music and a bunch of different bands and a bunch of the iconic players. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's like, I feel like for me anyways, that was a key component in, Oh, like I need to really pay attention to not only what I'm doing, but what everyone else is doing. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess I don't know what to say about that. I, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, for, for you, what is it? Is there like a record or something where you were like, oh my gosh. This, this, I feel this differently than I felt music before. Mm. Is it a continuous thing or it, did it happen while you were drumming? You know, like you know for, for me, it's like, there's a couple records that the, when I heard them and the rabbit holes that they took me down, like they forever changed me, but. Yeah, they, there's a lot of them. They flow in and out seasonally. Uh, and this kind of, when I explain this, it, it's like what we talked about the other day before the podcast. It's like the songs or the albums or the bands that I like are, you can hook me right away if I can kind of close my eyes, listen to that song. And have that conversation with myself where I'm like, I can play this song. I can play this music. I can do it note for note. And what would it feel like if I was playing this song in front of 2,000 people? How fucking badass would it be? And it can be... You know, I'm a big Abe Cunningham fan. So it could be just smash rock and roll, battle axe, death tones. Or it can be, you know, simple hi-hat chokes and four on the floor playing Serpentine Fire by Earth, Wind and Fire. It can be, you know, the way you envision going ba 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 on three symbols and just how like badass that is. Like any drummer can go ba ba ba, but like for some reason you envision Tommy Lee doing it 30 times better than any other drummer, including myself. So you put yourself, like you hear that hair rock song and you're just like, 
I'm putting myself on that stage as like that Tommy Lee hitting those. The only thing that matters in the song are those three crash cymbals. Then it's just like, for me, that can make the whole song. Can make the whole song. That's how, you know, so when we started doing music together, like I loved Tool. Tool was this goal that I... Who, who, how did you hear about Tool? Uh, I, I mean, bro, uh, Tool, Opeth, Porcupine Tree, Cannibal Corpse, Mudvayne, The Bled, um, shoot, maybe even Mars Volta, I don't know. Uh, well, no, it would have definitely have been... Definitely would have been from Jordan. Uh, Mars at Volta. the drive-in. Would have been the, at the yeah, drive-in. That's what I'm saying. That would have been from Jordan. <clears throat> I mean, and I'm missing out so many more. We're all you guys. Was all Catalyst. I mean... Yeah, I mean, really, uh, I, I'm i pretty sure it's Sam. It might just all be Sam. Yeah. Well, I mean, I remember... <laughs> I remember going into FYI with you, Gordo, and Sam, and you guys had this thing where you would buy the CD that you wanted. Okay, so I got two good stories. The first time, I got two good ones. So we'll do this one. Uh, you guys would go buy a CD that you really wanted. So it'd be like the Opeth double disc. And then you had an extra little bit of money and it was Ryzen Hoover that would kind of like make it his mission to just buy something in the section that he liked, which was metal, and then just go completely off reading a book by its cover. Yeah. And I remember... I, 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 that was definitely Sam's practice and Sam, that's how he found out about so many fucking So many bands. bands. And I remember being in that FYI in the Gateway Mall and just looking at the Cannibal Corpse cover <laughs> art that he had just bought. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still like this very goody two-shoes. I was just playing Now That's Music 12. Like, oh, dude, that, that was me 100%. Like, I'm I'm just like, hey, after this, I'm going to go home and play to my mom's Reba McIntyre's exactly. 45. It's like, <laughs> A single mom who works to the girls. <laughs> right. And then I remember him playing said Cannibal Corpse CD and just being like, oh, my God, this is the grossest shit on the planet um, come full circle in like 2011, 12, sharing the stage with them <laughs> <laughs> in uh, Pomona, California on a metal blade um, sort of like promotional show or something. And then that meeting them and just being like, oh, you guys are like some of the nicest human beings on the planet. Yeah like extremely humble people and just having to kind of keep my mouth shut of being like, dude, when I was 13, 14 years old, I thought you guys were just like the shittiest band on the planet. <laughs> um, so that was that story. And then uh, fast forward, the very first time I met Sam, um, was at a basement birthday party and uh, this was like the either the day or the week that Blink 182's Take Your Pants Off and Jacket came out. And so I remember the birthday girl getting that on DVD or on on uh, CD. And Sam rolls in, and I had heard about him through our friend Ben that introduced us to Catalyst, or got Catalyst to what it is, got me out of the basement. And Sam had this album, which was LD50 by Mudvayne. And I just remember trying to be so cool at this party and being like, oh, yeah, I've heard that album. It's really good. And the first thing Sam says to me is like, oh, yeah? 
what's your favorite song? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I, I can't remember the name of the song, but it's like the third or fourth one on the album. And then him just straight calling me out, being like, I don't think you listen to this music, dude. <laughs> and then kind of being, well, of course, being very much butthurt about it. Um, I actually went and got it on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and then listened to it. And same response as the Cannibal Corpse was just like, oh, what is this horrid shit? Um, and shelved it. And then ended up like LD50. It became your Bible for a bit. Oh, yeah. 100%. Absolutely. I mean, still to this day, like my favorite, my favorite Mudvayne CD. Yeah. I mean, they, see, they, they, it is the best. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But so that was my intro into meeting the singer in my first band and getting called out for metal music for yeah, not knowing dude. my shit. <clears throat> dude, Sam, he he fucking discovered everything sam discovered everything yeah he was I mean, he was like the god he had this like the inside his fucking cd booklet was so legit every yeah. page was just like uh, uh, uh. we were yeah. like 12 <laughs> we were 12 or 13 damn he was cool yeah i mean he had everything that every like 90s meme talks about I mean, I yeah no, I can dude, almost, he, and I and can like almost, he, what I loved about his collection too is he would like keep it totally real. He'd be like, yeah, that CD's not that good. I oh, bought yeah. it. I bought it because the cover art was like this, but the CD sucked. And yeah, if you really yeah. want a crazy one, this one doesn't look like it's crazy, but it's super nuts. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also I feel like I, 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 we were all still really good about it, but we um. Even when we were in that band, we were not afraid to like listen to other shit. No, I don't know. I just, I just remember a lot of goofing off where we weren't necessarily. Oh, I mean, I was only new metal. I was very open to to listening to everything that you guys had because it was all new to me. I'm telling you, dude, it's it's a critical component. Like knowing at least familiarizing yourself. There's so much music out there. There's so many different genres and subgenres. Um, I, I don't know. It's like a critical component. All the people that I see who are like fucking monsters, just shredders, who like as soon as they do whatever they do, the first note, you know, oh, that's that person. Those people are always the people with like, I, I, who truly listen to everything. A lot of people say they listen to everything. <clears throat> they really don't. <clears throat> they really don't listen to everything. No, they listen everything that just, they like. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but also just barely outside everything that they like. You know, I was I was actually having a conversation with my mom the other day about it, and we were talking about this upcoming podcast. And my mom's a music teacher as well, and you know, I mean, we were just kind of talking about how like. You know, if you're listening to, I, I, I was talking to her about how I haven't listened to the radio since the early 2000s and how the past probably over a year uh, and I go in and out, but I do, I am very mindful of making certain periods of my life of like this month or this season or whatever where i actively search for something new mm. but like way outside of anything that i would listen to so i mean thanks also to like instagram and social media sure if the you algorithm. go down and, yeah if you go down an interesting rabbit hole enough like did i found this like hip-hop group from japan that just like kills it I found this group from Northern Africa that like has this really gritty Southern um, guitar tone to them. And like from countries that don't normally by any means adopt the 4-4 time signature. Yeah. And to be able to play Westernized music and have your country's soul into it 
it's just like, who knows when I would have found that if I was locked into my bubble. Or there's like, you know, I saw a thing, there's this piano player, he went to like the London Conservatory, and his main gig is being the musical producer for like a lot of hip hop guys, and rap artists in Europe, in the UK. And all the rap songs are like, all right. But then you hear his conservatory stuff, and it is like each song is named after a, a place in the world that he's visited. And each song is a piano concerto of his feelings of being yeah. in said place. Yeah. And it's just like, it's fucking beautiful. I wouldn't have been able to find that unless you like are very opening, open to, I mean, being on social media is the easy part, but then it's like, you know, you got to find it. Then you got to get off of social media and you've got to go on to said music app and you've got to search for that album. And then you got to spend the time, like the investment of sitting and listening to all of it. Yeah. God damn it. Sit down and listen to music. I know. Sit down for 30 minutes and listen crazy. to an album. It's crazy. What kind of assholes do you think we are around here? What is this? 20, 2005? <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's also the great thing about LA traffic is I, I, as horrible as it is, I can voluntarily put myself in a situation to listen to a lot of that. Have music. nothing else better to do. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I don't know. Like that's why I, I have always, <clears throat> even in the city, like whenever I have to drive around the city, I love it. Even if it's going to take me a long time, just being in that little bubble up, you know, put on a record, even anymore too. Like, I just don't care the, even if they're, if I can't connect my phone and just put on the radio, whatever, it doesn't matter. Sure. But, uh, um, I don't know. It's like, uh, I think also too, for me, it's like, it's being humble enough and, and honest enough to where, you know, you, I, so I have iTunes and I don't have the Spotify or anything like that, but I can go on to iTunes and a lot of what I'll do is I'll just go on genres and then, you know, you can find Afro Cuban and you can just go down some crazy rabbit holes there. And a lot of it's like the new club Afro Cuban um, sort of music, but you can find some like real bangers or you go down flamenco or this, that, and the other. And it's like going back to kind of that, like, tying in that like spiritual or just call it however you want to. It's like, you're going to find a lot of music by doing that, by being open with yourself and just saying like, I'm going to sit the fuck down for an hour and a half ride to go teach the kids. And I'm, and like 14 out of the 20 songs that I listen to are going to be garbage and you're not going to like it, but try to immerse yourself into it. And I think that, two things out of it is like one you're better going to be able to go out of it where someone's like you could tell someone or you can relate to someone like oh yeah i was listening to this stuff the other day like maybe more your type of jam um start a conversation that way with them be able to connect with them through that means of course you're going to be able to with the music those other songs that you connected with out of the out of the 20 but then also too it's like musically as a good musician one part of being a good musician is being able to put on correctly many hats and well that that's what i was saying before it's like the the people who are real shredders it doesn't matter what the fucking song is they're gonna whatever they play is gonna fit perfectly they're gonna yeah. know their delicate sensibilities will guide them to do the exact right things for what's called for in that scenario, whether it's metal, avant-garde, jazz, you know, pop, it doesn't matter. Like real pro ass motherfuckers, people who are actually like listening to what the other people are doing around them. Right. Um, I don't know. That's, that's, 
I think not only listening to other people around them, but listening to the experiences that they've had with said genre of music. Meaning, like, you know, I have this rock and roll background, but I know through the feeling of how the music made me feel what, you know, like a, and playing said type of music, what like a Jack Johnson feels like. That very acoustic island um, sort of sound that he has. I, so what I'm trying to say is like, not that he wouldn't be able to do it, but you couldn't take, it'd be, it'd be interesting to take a very metal first drummer and say like, hey, we're going to go do a pop Jack Johnson song. But you have someone like a Steve Jordan who's done the gambit of everything and would be able to fit, I feel, both quite perfectly. Uh, interesting story about Steve Jordan. He literally played drums on some shit that I was working on. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Their prime example. He knew nothing. He walked in and it was like a. I mean, really, the song was kind of like a post-rocky, uh, uh, you know, completely instrumental, just moody, vibey, buildy thing, and he was just going to play for the drums. for the crypto thing. Yeah, the crypto company, right, right, right. And he came in and just he heard it and fucking three takes. Yeah, but that's kind of the reason why I chose him because it's like I can't help but think with the vast amount that he's done in his catalog that vary so drastically. I mean, jazz drummer got huge, huge playing with John Mayer. But I mean, the amount of fusion stuff that he's probably done, which is just like next door neighbors to metal. Yeah, really? Um, it's just like, you know, I say I say a name like his because it's like that is a guy that not knowing him, but knowing him, knowing who he is, that guy can has a closet full of hats that he can put on. Sure. To fill any sort of musical genre, including the Rolling Fucking Stones. Sure, absolutely. I mean, oh, here's another great one: is like Josh Freeze. You know, I mean, now Foo Fighters drummer has done Debatably everything. the sound of early 2000s drums. Sure. Everything from a perfect circles, nine inch nails. Oh, really? He's the on vandals. the record. He is the drummer. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember hearing a story about him where he got a call one day from his manager and was like, hey, Josh, like, congratulations. Uh, I have a platinum album plaque here at my office where do you want me to send it your studio or your house and josh was like Whoa, what are you talking about i haven't i haven't done anything crazy as of recent and he gets it and it was before the lyrics were put on the track it was him drumming to skater boy by avril Lavigne. oh my god <laughs> <laughs> and then That's on hilarious. top of that, if you listen to Just Haven't Met You Yet by Michael Buble, which that whole album had multiple drummers on it, uh, and a lot of them like big band sure. drummers, because that was an album that was in the James Bond movie at the time. Mm. But Just Haven't Met You Yet was his single. And Josh was on the drums for that song. So it's just, it shows the importance of the vast amount of music if you take it, if, if you treat it as it's your responsibility and your job as a musician, that you, you really do need to be around. I feel yeah, I, it, it, it's in any other context, it would be studying, learning shit, 
to get better at your trade or tr- trade or craft. Like, you know, if, if you really love music, you should be able to at least it to some degree encyclopedically pick apart different types of music and what differentiates the different types of musics. And, uh, uh, I don't know the, the, that to me is like, uh, of course the biggest thing is practice. That's the biggest thing. Practice and playing though. That's, <clears throat> that's, that's the biggest thing, but yeah. Just playing the instrument isn't the same as um, playing the instrument, if that isn't vague enough. You know what I mean? It's it's one thing to to make noise. It's another thing to say something. And, and you know, it's, it's one of those things where a lot of musicians, I feel like a lot of musicians never, ever get anywhere close to being able to say something with their instrument. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um just because of lacking in practice or lacking in exposure to, or lacking in drive to really pursue it the way they, they, they should. Sure. I'll add one on to that too. I think it's also, you've got a lot of musicians that hold on to their idols and then they just end up sounding. Yeah. Right. Like they don't listen idols. to anything else. Right. They just listen to that. Right. Um, which, I'm a firm believer starting out as a musician, you know, I needed my Mount Rushmore drummers. And I still, to this day, like, just because I love so many drummers and I could have 10 Mount Rushmores of drummers, but I always just kind of go to the old from way back in the early 2000s. It's like Danny Carey, Abe Cunningham, so Tool, Deftones, Carter Buford, who's Dave a, Matthews, yep, is a shredder man. Yeah, um, one of the best to ever do it. Yeah, you know, and then you've got Buddy Rich, and you know, I mean, we could insert a thousand more after that. Um, I think it's important. You know, I'm I'm trying to envision what I would say and have said to my students. It's like you need to find those two or three or four musicians. And, you know, I think I'm not opposed to, if you're an artist, copy someone that you admire. Dude, that's, that's all of music. And what do you it's, mean? It's, you're greenlit. This is the one area where it's like, go ahead and build off of what we laid out. Sure. I mean, I've heard people and those, those people are, and those arguments are, probably not worth the investment in listening to so heavily, but like, you know, during COVID music was done. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And so I needed an art outlet. So I got a camera and it was just like, thank God for social media. I was mimicking the shooting styles of artists that I really liked on social media and it trans it transposes perfectly into music. It's like, if you're a guitar player, I I know if I was a guitar player, I would be just glued to like Stevie Ray Vaughan's leg. I fucking love him. Oh, fucking course you would. Um, you know, who do you think I would say? Like Steve by no, uh, no Stevie Ray Vaughan. That makes sense. That tracks. Sure. But I mean, now let's, let's equate that to like the drum. Well, I guess that would be different because Stevie's a whole nother monster, but like, you know, when you start drumming, I think the first few things you need to be listening to personally is James Brown and Michael Jackson. If you don't have a good understanding of four on the floor and how to make, well, I mean, foundation, sure. foundation, sure. And it's foundation. like, it's like, copy and figure out how and this was and still to this day is very hard for me it's like figure out how to take three instruments a hi-hat a snare drum and a kick drum and just make it as sex as you possibly can and especially now in the age of social media and in the age of like everyone posting their highlight reel and youth being influenced by just seeing 
such awesome chaos on social media, it's like the kick snare in the hat is the first thing that's forgotten. It's, I need an 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. I need an auxiliary snare. I need well, three yeah, splash symbols and a crash. And, it right, needs to right. be a spectacle. Um, Here, wait, Ian. Actually, we're going we're gonna to pause that thought and continue this on XLB, which is for Patreons only at our Patreon page. Uh, it's XLB. This has been the free portion of the Totally Legitimate Business Podcast. Ian, stay on, and we'll get into the rest of this heady shit in XLB. I've got a few thoughts on that, <clears throat> too. Okay. So let's. Uh, I'm going to ring in this little outro, and we'll be right back for those on the Patreon. This has been the Totally Legitimate Business Podcast. The end. With your host, James Oliva. Who? Executive producers, Clint Chi and James Oliva. That's obnoxious. Sound design, mix, and master by James Oliva. Literally no one cares. For more Totally Legitimate Business, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Totally Legitimate Business or add us on TikTok at TLB Pod. When will this end? Thank you for listening. Now get back to work. Moving along, buddy.